Hebrews chapter number 4, where we've already been this morning in our uh, congregational Bible reading. Uh, some of you may or may not know tonight is Super Bowl. Uh, the Super Bowl is tonight, Super Bowl Sunday. Is there anybody here going for the Chiefs? We have one committed over here. Any Eagle fans? Eagles? All right. Okay, there's four or five of you. Amen. Who's going for really good food? Yeah. That's what I'm rooting for, good food and fellowship and lots of fun with friends and family. And so I'm, I just want to say, yay, go wings. Amen. All right. So I heard it said one time that a football game is made up of dozens of men in desperate need of rest, surrounded by thousands of people in desperate need for exercise. And I think there's something, something humor and truth to that statement. We're in Hebrews chapter number four. I love, are you guys loving Hebrews? I, man, it is so, so rich. And I am, I am so excited about it. Um, last week, we really covered chapter 4, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 through 9, actually into verse 11. Uh, today we're going to move on from verse 11 to verse 12 and 13. Very, very familiar passages of Scripture, but this is my first time studying through the passages that lead up to Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. And the context of Hebrews chapter 4, and I hope you experienced this last week. If you're not with us, I'll give you a little summary of what we learned. Uh, there's a word that's used, rest, and this word that's used nine times in our English translation, it's this word, rest. And he, he's been using it. He started, the author of Hebrews started back in chapter three, uh, giving us this illustration of, um, and this quotation from Psalm 95 that refers back to um, Numbers chapter 13 and 14, talking about the children of Israel when they left Egypt and they went through the wilderness and they got to the promised land but did not go in. And they did not go in because of one reason. What was it? Does anybody remember? Unbelief. There was a lack of faith. They did not believe God and so they did not go in. So in verses 1 to 9, which is what we studied last week, we talked about this word rest, and we said that, who, did anybody go home and have a nap last Sunday? Yeah, some of you guys, I got you into rest, and that's not necessarily what I was thinking about, but you're applying the sermon, and that's good. Amen, you're doing that. Um, what is the rest that he's talking about? Well, he's talking about Sabbath rest, the context tells us that it was a reference to how God described what he did at the end of creation. The Sabbath rest was an example that God called his people to in the Ten Commandments. The Sabbath day was a ceasing of labor for the express purpose of focusing on their relationship with God. And if you look at Hebrews chapter 4, look at verse number, um, let's see, number 3. For which, for, and going into verse 4, for we which have believed do enter in his rest, as he said, I have sworn in my wrath, that if they shall enter into my rest, although the works of them were finished from the foundation of the world, for he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. So there's talking there about creation rest or a Sabbath rest. And then he also talked about a Canaan rest. I'm catching you up here, okay? Look, in verse number... Um, Three, which I just wrote, for we which have it, believed to enter into his rest, he said, I have sworn in my wrath that they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. If you were to go back into chapter 3, he talks about, um, look, I'm, I'm kind of improvising here. Uh, if you look in chapter 3, Verse number, eight, verse number seven, wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, verse eight, as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years, when I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in their heart, 
and they have not known my ways, so I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. And what we said was, Psalm 95 quoting that, was talking about Numbers 13 and 14, where the children of Israel, again, did not enter into Canaan what Jesus called, or what God called in Psalm 95, my rest. Rest was a reference to the children of Israel going out of Egypt from the wilderness and into the promised land or into my rest. The idea was that they were out of their bondage in Egypt. They were to be they were to go through the wilderness and into a place where they would settle and live. Of course, that first generation out of Egypt did not go into his rest because of unbelief, as was expressed by David. And then he says to us, hey, not only is there a creation rest and a Canaan rest, there's still a rest for us. In this text, the author of Hebrews also references this idea of rest as something that still exists and is still available for the people of God through faith. This is explicitly stated in verse 9. You guys see it? Hebrews 4, 9. There remaineth therefore a rest for the people of God. What is this rest that remains for both the Jewish believers, but also for us? Well, there's two aspects to it. One, there's a salvation rest. Salvation rest. It includes salvation. You cannot experience God's rest... If you have not been saved, our sin separates us from a holy God, and it's by believing and trusting the good news preached to us that we are made alive through and brought into a relationship with God. We do not have to rely on our own good works to make us right with God. We trust in Christ's work on the cross as the righteousness that is given to us to make us right with God. We're saved by His work, not by our works. You guys agree with that? We're not saved. You can't do enough good to outweigh your bad. You can't. And that's ex- expressed here in verse 10. Look at verse 10. For he that has entered into his rest, the salvation rest, has also ceased from his own works as God did from his. We can't rest on our own works to get us and make us right with God. Then he goes on to say this, verse 10. For he that has entered into his rest, like I said, like I said has cease from his own works. But that means there's also a sanctification rest. Once we have salvation rest, we have the positional relationship with God. We are afforded the opportunity to have fellowship with God. We can have a closeness with God. We can have a walk with, with him that allows us to have a transformative rest in him. Here's Here's the idea of rest, and I know I've talked about it a lot, and we talked about it last week, but I want you to understand it, and I know on any given week there's people that weren't here last week, and I want, you to, I want to tell you, welcome, we're glad you're here, but I want you to understand this. There is no eternal rest with God outside of Jesus Christ. There, there is a rest that will happen one day when we get to heaven. There's no more sorrow. No more tears, no more fighting, no more fighting. There's really no more politics. We're going to have a benevolent dictator. What he wants to have happen is what's going to happen. And he loves us, and he sent his son to die for us. It's going to be awesome. So there's an aspect to this rest that's a heavenly rest that we're not, we, we haven't experienced yet. You, you have been saved. If you know Christ as your Savior, you were saved. You are saved. You're being saved. And one day you will be saved. Do you get it? So there's a salvation rest, but there's also a sanctification rest. He says in verse 11, Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. So it's not just heavenly rest, it's not just salvation rest. There is a a way of having a relationship with God right now that is qualified as rest. And if you've been close to the Lord, if you've walked with the Lord, if there was a time where you weren't walking with the Lord even though you were saved, and now that you're saved, you're walking closely with the Lord, you've experienced that. If you've ever had peace in the middle of a very difficult situation, if you've ever gotten a diagnosis, and you still have the peace of God in you, 
you've experienced that rest. You know what I'm talking about? If you've ever not had a lot of money in the bank and it didn't stress you out because you got Jesus in your heart, you've experienced that rest. God wants us to not only have the rest positionally, he, has, he wants us to have it experientially. Jesus said, I've come to give you life and that life more abundant. That's what he wants to do. We believe God for salvation and he saves us. We labor to stay in fellowship with God because it's easier for us to get distracted from staying, from obeying and focusing on our relationship with him. And that's why he says you need to labor not to get saved, but to stay in that restful position in that walk with the Lord. What will keep you out of it? He says it right there. Lest any man fall after the same example of what? Unbelief. So the question then, here it is. The question in, who, who, wants, to, who wants to maintain a relationship with God that's characterized by rest? I want that. I want to have a close, intimate fellowship with God. I hope you do too. In fact, I think that if you do, we'll look at this in some other passages, when you do, the Bible says that when we abide in Jesus, he's the vine, we're the branches. When we abide in him, he produces fruit. And that's fruit that will remain. That's awesome. I want him transforming me like that, and I want him using me like that. And if we have a church full of people that are abiding in Christ and producing fruit, man, we'll change this community. Not us. God will do it. That's the point. The question then is, if we want this, how does it happen? Who agrees? This is what God wants, right? Is it God's will that we enter into his rest? Yeah. But not all of us, not all of us are always there. Is that right? Anybody been out of fellowship with the Lord this week? At some point? Yeah. So how do, we, how do we stay in fellowship with him? How, how do we labor to enter into that rest? If unbelief is what keeps us from entering that rest, how do we grow in our faith? And the answer to this is found so clearly in these next two verses. These two verses that we quote so often without any reference to rest are not disconnected from that concept. Okay? I'm not saying it's wrong that we quote it, not connected to it, but isn't it so much richer once you connect it to its context? It is. If you understand and apply the truth of today's text and the truth of the last two sermons that we've said, there is so much joy available to you. Not one person here smiled at that. There is so much joy. God is not this grumpy person up in heaven wanting you to just do what I say. God wants you to experience joy. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit. If you do what he says, you will experience joy. You know, joy is so much better than happiness because joy remains when happiness goes. There is a, so much rest available for you. There is so much fruit that will abound in your life. This is how God's power could flow through you in incredible ministry. God, help me to believe this myself and live this out for our people. God, help our people to live this out for Finley and unto the uttermost part of the earth. How, how does this happen? It happens by God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit through his word. That's how it happens. In the mind and word and words of the author of Hebrews, he goes right back to the word of God. If the issue is a lack of faith, that unbelief that he keeps talking about, if that's what keeps us from God's rest, then the thing that will bring faith is the thing that will keep us in God's rest. And I'm thinking about a verse. Where is it? Where do we get faith from? Where does it come from? Oh, there it is. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the... You know why that works? Because the same guy who wrote Romans is the same person who wrote Hebrews. You're saying, you believe Paul? 
wrote Hebrews? I don't know, but I know the Holy Spirit did. The Holy Spirit wrote Romans, and he wrote Hebrews. The whole thing works together because it's really one author. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Here's what I want you to know today. The Word of God is essential in bringing us into God's rest and transforming us because it's the only resource that can accurately embody these three descriptions that we find here in verses 12 and 13. Here's the first description. Are you ready? Number one, the Word of God is transforming because it's alive. It's alive. Look at verse 12. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. In these two verses, we're given an incredible description of the nature and the function of the Word of God. The word right, ne- right here in our um, verse, it says, for the Word of God is quick. That word quick that's translated quick, comes from a Greek word that is zao, Z-A-O, in our, the way we would write it in English. And zao literally means alive. It means alive. It's found 144 times in our English translation, and it's translated as live, living, alive, lived, quick, lively, livest, or livest, life and lifetime. So when I say my point My first point is that the Word of God is alive. It's because that's what the Bible says. (laughs) I'm trying to make the point that the passage says. How is the Word of God alive? How is it alive? Like you're saying, Ben, I don't hear a heartbeat. What do you mean the Word of God is alive? Well, let me give you a couple ideas. First, the Word of God is, the Word is alive because God the Father is alive. Let's set, it in his, let's set this in this context. Psalm 95 and Hebrews 3 and 4 have taught us that God has a plan and an instruction for us. Here's God's plan. Go into my rest. There's a promised land for you to get to. Not only salvation, but a walk with the Lord. There's an accountability here then to a real author who really wrote to us. That's why he says, today... If you, will, if you will hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. God didn't just say this back when Hebrews was written, and nor did he just say it when Psalm 95, nor was he re- uh, wanting them to just go in back into his rest back in Numbers 13 and 14. What day is it? It's February 12th, 2023, and God's message for us today is, Believe! Trust me. Depend on me. Go in. Is this God's will just in the past? No, it's for today. It's for today. There's an accountability here to a real author who really wrote to us. The writer of Psalms and Hebrews is telling us that this real God who really exists, who is really speaking to us specifically, will hold us accountable for how we respond to his word. He didn't just say it. He is saying it. Go into my rest. The word of God is also alive because, this is going to make you excited, ready? The son is alive. Jesus Christ isn't dead. He's alive. He's alive. Consider again John 15. I'm not going to execute the whole passage, but think about it. Jesus, John 15, 1. I am the vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. You know what purgeth it means? It's talking about pruning. I I had a plant in Florida on Noonan Court, the dead end we lived on. and, And there was a plant that was in the front, and I hated it. One day I got fed up with it enough to go start cutting on it, and I cut it down all the way to the stump almost. And then I got to where I'm like, then I thought I would just dig it out, and I couldn't dig it out. Megan wouldn't help me. (laughs) 
so I set it aside for another day, and like two or three weeks later, it was bigger than it was before. And I thought, I think I'll leave it. No more cutting it. Sometimes God prunes us to grow us. That happens. God is a great, yeah. Verse 3, now you are clean through my, what is it? Through the, now you are clean, verse 3, you see it? Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken in you. Abide in me, Jesus says, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the, bo- I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Jesus' claim is that abiding in him is connected with hearing him, obeying him, and when, you, when that happens, all kind of fruit is produce, produced. Can dead things produce life? No. Life comes from life. And there's all kinds of life in these verses. Stay in me, Jesus says. I'm alive because I live. You shall live also. As the Father has sent me, so send I you. This is God's plan. We can't do ministry outside of Jesus. We can't do ministry outside of God. We can't do it outside of his word. The word of God is alive because God's alive because Jesus is alive. Here's another good one. Ready? You can guess it. (laughs) The word of God is alive because the Holy Spirit is alive. The Holy Spirit is alive. He's the author of the book. Scripture tells us that the Holy Spirit is the ultimate author of the pages of Scripture. Do you believe that? 1 Peter 1, sorry, 2 Peter 1.20 says this, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scriptures of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. We're told that, that God wrote a book. He did it through the Holy Spirit. We're told that at salvation, the Holy Spirit then comes to live or to reside in the life of the believer. To not have the Holy Spirit residing in us is to not be saved. Romans 8 says this, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the, what does it say? But in the Spirit If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. The Word of God is a lie. So if you're saved, you're like, I don't feel like this. It doesn't matter what you feel. If you're saved, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. If you're not saved, you don't have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. So how is the Word of God alive? God wrote a book, and then he sent his author of that book to live inside of you. The Word of God is alive because its author lives in us. If you think the Word of God is dead, like, man, I read the Bible and it's dead, it may be that the Word of the the Holy Spirit may not live inside of you. Maybe you think it's dead because you don't have that relationship with God. He says, that the Holy Spirit lives in, in us and can't leave us. And that's why Ephesians says in Ephesians 4.30, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. You know what that means? He's in you. He can't leave you. And because he can't leave you, you could grieve him by not doing what he says. Any parents here ever get grieved by disobedient children? Like about... An hour ago, <laughs> I've been grieved by disobedient children. I have great kids most of the time. But we do that to God. When we disobey him, he's living inside of us, and that's not rest when we grieve him. So the next two descriptions lay on the foundation of this first description. The, the word of God is alive because God is alive. He is omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, omnisapient. He's all-knowing, all-powerful, always present, and supremely wise. His word is revealing, is, is his revealing of who he is. His word, he will promise to support and fulfill. His word is alive. 
We can enter into God's transforming rest through his word because the word is alive. We can also enter into God's transforming rest through his word because it is powerful. It is powerful. Isn't that what it says? For the word of God is quick and powerful. The Greek word for powerful, you're going to like this, is the word energase. Sounds like the word where we get the idea, energy, right? Energetic. It means active, operative, effectual, powerful. It comes from other, two other words, which means with work or with activity. The word of God is active. It works. It makes a difference. It transforms. As I was trying, how do I prove this? How do I, what do I write to talk about the word of God being powerful? And I just found a bunch of scripture. Are you ready? I'm going to read it. Don't get bored. Get excited. Don't get bored. Get excited. Here we go. 1 Corinthians 1.18 for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish fullness, but unto us which are saved it's the power of God. Isaiah 55, 10. For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. But it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent, sent it. John 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Can God's word cleanse us? Amen. It can cleanse us. While other books inform and some few reform, this one book transforms. A.T. Peterson. Other books were given for our information. The Bible was given for our transformation. Howard Hendricks said this, the Bible was not written to satisfy your curiosity, but to make you conform to Christ's image, not to make you a smarter sinner, but to make you like the Savior. Not to fill your head with a collection of biblical facts, but to transform your life. When someone stands at this pulpit or any of our Sunday school classes or anywhere you go teaching the Word of God, that is not American Idol for preaching. Do I want to do a good job? Yes, I do. But I'm not trying to inform you only. There's some things you got to know. There's some things you got to know, but the point is not knowing. The point is doing. The point is being transformed so that you'll be something else, so that you'll do something else. Do you get it? So if your only thought is, man, I was bored, or man, that was good. Our preacher's good. Or man, Corey did a great job. If that's your only thought, you're thinking about it wrong. Am I stepping on some toes? The thought ought to be, God, how do I obey what I just heard? God, where, I'm, where is there a gap between what I'm doing and what I just heard? And if you think you've been completely obedient to it, take heed lest you fall, the Bible says. Jeremiah 23, 29. Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? Chuck Colson said, the Bible, banned, burned, beloved, more widely read, more frequently attacked than any other book in history. Generations of intellectuals have attempted to discredit it. Dictators of every age have outlawed it and executed those who read it. Yet soldiers carry it into battle, believing it more powerful than their weapons. Fragments of it smuggled into solitary prison cells have transformed ruthless killers into gentle saints. The word of God is powerful, both in its durability and its ability to change the lives of those who read it, believe its precepts, and obey its truths. The Bible is powerful. Number three, the Bible is transforming because it's discerning. Now this is, this point is crazy good in the scripture. He says here, 
the word of God is quick and powerful, and then he goes on and makes a, alludes to a metaphor. And sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. There's a third description. It's a description of the Bible as discerning. This two-edged sword is not the only place where the Bible is referred to as a sword. Ephesians 6, 17, we studied this just a few months ago. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. What does a sword do when it's implemented? When they actually use the sword, I'm not trying to be graphic, but this is a chance for young teenage boys to really like this part of the sermon. (laughs) When you stab something with a sword, what does it do? It cuts, it pierces, exactly what it says. It divides. It divides. There's something to learning and discerning that divides. What do I mean? Tonight's the Super Bowl. So I will use football as my illustration. Each individual player on the team was developed like I was about to tell you. Let's take the quarterback for, for instance. The best quarterbacks are going to learn about grip in football, how to actually hold the football before you throw it. They're going to learn about throwing motion. They're going to learn about reading the defense. They're going to learn about leading the receiver when you throw it towards them. They're going to learn about ball faking and scrambling. They're going to learn about handing off. They're going to learn about play calling. All of these elements individually and more make up the totality of all that they have to learn in being a good quarterback. Does that make sense? You don't just go learn to be a good quarterback. That's descriptive of a whole bunch of skills that you've got to learn. Now, now, we're living out life as God designed it. He has a plan and a purpose for us. You and I live physical and emotional and relational and intellectual and spiritual lives. These things are interconnected, right? We live from our hearts, from what we believe. Our behavior displays our beliefs. For our behavior to change, our beliefs must be changed, and our beliefs come from our hearts, and so our hearts have to be changed. Do you get it? Are you walking with me on this? Now read the verse. The Word of God helps divide out what's inside of us. That's what it's saying. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even into the dividing of sunder of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Soul and spirit. These are parts of the... There are parts of Scripture where where the word for soul and spirit are used interchangeably. There are also parts of Scripture where a distinction is made. I personally believe that we're made up of three parts, body, soul, and spirit, trichotomous. That's what I believe. That's what the the Bible teaches. But there definitely are parts where they use soul and spirit interchangeably. Some have said that the reasoning part of us is the soul and the spiritual part of us is our spirit. Only the Bible can discern between these two and help us behave accordingly. Here he talks about joints and marrow. One commentator said, the word of God can get right down into this flesh of ours and make a distinction. There's a connection between our spiritual lives and our souls and our bodies. Have you ever noticed that? The way that you believe, the way that you're walking with the Lord can be affected by our physical bodies. Has anybody ever noticed that? David said this in Psalm 32, verse 1. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity and whose spirit there is no guile, when I kept silence, meaning when I was unrepentant and hid my sin, when I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. Was that a man who was affected physically by his sin? Have you ever seen somebody who wore their sin on their body? You've seen that. He says here, he, the Bible is a discerner and, and of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The word here for discerner is the word kritikos. What does that sound like? 
Sounds like Greek. Okay, thank you. That was very good. <laughs> Kritikos, critical, decisive, discriminative, discerning. Thayer's dictionary says this word is relating to judging, fit for judging, skilled in judging. Of what is the word a discerner or a critic? The thoughts and intents of the heart. There are so many people who are critical of the Bible, but the Bible is critical of us. What do I mean? It discerns or it critiques. This is why some people don't like it. They don't want to be exposed. But think about it again. Again, back to the sports world. Why do elite players have coaches? Why? Why do the best at their sport have people critiquing their game? Michael Jordan was once asked what he thought his best skill was. He didn't say it was his ability to dunk or his or his shooting, or his scoring ability, his answer was this, I was coachable. I was a sponge and aggressive to learn. That's what he said was his best skill. What is a coach if not a critic? Doesn't a coach help the player discern what he is doing wrong and instruct him in doing right? The Bible refers to itself as a mirror. Someone who hears the word and doesn't do it is like the one who beholds himself in a glass and walks away and doesn't remember what he is. But he who is, but he who is, is someone who discerns that perfect law of liberty, he's the one that stays in it, remains in it, and becomes a doer of the word. When you look at the mirror, and it's, I'm, I'm glad some of you are here today and I have looked in a mirror before you got here. Because you saw how you were and you changed because of it. Amen. Who's here I'm glad that I did that? Who here is questioning whether I did that? Hey, right. The Word of God kind of shows me where I messed up. It shows me where there's a gap. Think about that quarterback who tells his coach, I don't like what you're telling me about my throwing motion or my ability to read defenses. We talk about coachability. A player can have all kinds of talent, but if he can't take instruction, he'll never be as good as he can be. The word of God here says it critiques, it discerns. Second, isn't that what 2 Timothy 3 tells us? All scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness. You know what that means? Doctrine, believe this, know this. Reproof, nope, stop doing that. That's wrong. Don't believe that. It's wrong. Correction, see what you did there? Stop doing that. Stop acting that way. Instruction in righteousness. Hey, do this instead. Act like this. Isn't that what the Bible, that's literally what 2 Timothy says. That's what the Bible is good for. Notice the realm of discernment in critiquing the word of God. Look at it says. It's a discerner of what? The thoughts and intents of what? The heart. Everything we are and everything we do flows out of our hearts. Jesus said it this way in Luke 6. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Our behavior is just the application of all that has been soaked up and believed by our hearts. It is out of that overflow that we live. When we come to the word of God, being willing to be discerned, being willing to be exposed by it and learn from it, we are leading into an understanding of ourselves and our world that will help us to live rightly. The truth is that we enter into, the exposure, into that exposure, seeing it ourselves, but that is exactly how God is able to see us anyway. If we don't go and look, we don't understand ourselves. When we go and look, we see ourselves. We're, we're coming into a submission to seeing ourselves the way God sees us. And that's exactly what he says in verse 13. Look at it. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. Whose sight? God's. But all things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. You know what that means? God knows you inside and out. He knows everything about you. He knows more about you than you do. 
The Bible is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart because sometimes I behave and I don't know what motivated me to do what I did. You ever blown up at somebody and you're like, why did I get so mad? Anybody ever had that happen? You ever sin and you're like, why do I keep doing this? God knows. And God wrote a book. And he says this book is alive and that it's active and that it will divide and help you understand why you do what you do. Talk about powerful. Talk about powerful. And here's what's true. He knows it anyway. God knows our hearts. He knows our thoughts. He knows why we do the things we do. It's because of that that he sent his son. Here's what's cool about that. God knows all that, and he still loves you. And he still loves me. And if your thought is, well, God knows me, of course to know me is to love me. You don't get it. You need to go read the Bible a little bit more. He knew that unless our hearts were changed, unless they were regenerated, our behavior would never be changed. Transformation would never be possible. So what did he do? He sent Jesus to die for us. He sent Jesus to save us. And when we trust in Christ as our Savior, he makes us new. He helps us to enter into his rest by transforming us from the inside out. He sanctifies us by exposing us to ourselves. We get to see as he sees. Let me tell you this. When you see as God sees, you'll do as God says. If you don't see how he sees, you won't do what he says. How do we know how God sees? He wrote a book. And he sent his spirit to live inside of you to help you understand it. His spirit comes in and dwells us, and as we read his word and submit to it, we begin to understand who we are. He convicts us. He convinces us. We repent. We are coached. We are critiqued. We are discerned. And then we have the opportunity for change. So let me sum up the whole sermon and really the last couple weeks. God loves you. He loves you so much. Because he loves you, he wants to transform you. He doesn't need to change everything, but there's a lot that he needs to change. When you put your faith and trust in him, there's a salvation rest that's available to you. Your destiny is changed. Your destiny is changed. But God doesn't want to just change your destiny one day. He wants to change you now. And he does that by wanting to have fellowship with you, intimacy with you, to give you not just peace with him, but that his peace would get into you. That's what we call rest. How to, but to do that, you have to believe. And how do you believe? You believe faith comes through the word of God. And the transforming process happens when we start to think like God thinks. How do we think like God thinks? There's a book that's alive. It's powerful. And it will help you discern what God wants for you and where you are yourself. So you begin to see the way he sees. The way he sees is you completely exposed, naked. He knows knows every sinful thought you ever did, everything you struggle with. And his plan is to help you get out of that bondage and into his rest. And so we do our part and God does his part. We believe, we have faith, we stay, we remain, and God transforms. What keeps people from the positional relationship with God, what keeps people from being saved? Unbelief. A lack of faith. We are saved by God's grace through faith. We put our trust in him and he saves us. What keeps believers from experiencing the full transformative fellowship that's available to us as God's rest? Unbelief. 
a lack of faith. That's why God's word tells us so often to abide, to remain, to stay, to hear and obey. There's this uh, old hymn that I thought of as I was writing. And um, I love hymns. And one of the things I love about them, and one of the things I loved about this hymn was this hymn that we sing. We haven't sung it in a while. I think we're singing it here in the next couple of weeks. This hymn that we sing, somebody obviously was studying the same book I was and is a lot better at poetry than I could ever be. I want you to think about this hymn in light of all that I've said the last three weeks. Here's what it says. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a, gl- what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Not a shadow can rise, not a doubt in the skies, but his smile quickly drives it away. Not a doubt or a fear, not a sight or a tear can abide while we trust and obey. But our toil, he, uh, oh, sorry, not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toil he doth richly repay. Not a grief or a loss, not a frown or a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. I love this. But we, can, we never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay for the favor he shows and the joy he bestows and for them who will trust and obey. Now listen to this last one. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet or we'll walk by his side in the way. Does that sound like rest? What he says we will do, here it is, where he sends we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey. Sing it with me. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. There remaineth therefore a rest, for the people of God. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me?